Hi, I'm James Hamilton from Stumping Up's Woodworking Journal, and this is the Pinless Dovetail Joint. A typical dovetail joint is made up of interlocking fingers called tails and pins. Here you see the flared portions, which are shaped like a dove's tail, thus the name, and they're separated by triangular pins. And on the other side of the joint, the tails appear as a set of rectangles, and the pins are the narrow bits between them. This side of the joint has always been considered less attractive than the other side. Now compare the joints to this box that I made. Here we have a set of dovetails, which would then make the bits in between pins, right? But look at the other side of the joint. Rather than seeing a series of rectangles, we see the same thing on this side as we did on the other, more dovetail shapes. That's because there aren't any pins in this joint, not in the strictest sense of the word, only interlocking dovetails. So both sides of the joint look identical. And while a traditional dovetail joint is only strong in one direction, it'll come apart this way, but not this way. A pinless dovetail joint like this one cannot come apart in either direction without actually breaking the wood. In fact, it's difficult to see how it can be assembled at all, as each dovetail is cut at a compound angle. The secret to this joint goes back centuries, when you may have found it not in the cabinet shops, but perhaps outside in the structures themselves. This joint was used by the Germans to build hewn log buildings, such as cabins. Some of these buildings still survive in America today, because the joint was not only very strong, but since every surface inside the joint is angled downward, water couldn't collect inside and cause rot. Years ago, I saw one of these buildings, and I always intended to make a box using the same unique joinery. But if there's one thing I've learned from life, it's this. If you procrastinate long enough, someone will do it for you. And lo and behold, about a week ago, an article by Eric Brown about just such a box appeared in the popular woodworking editor's blog. The only problem is, the article only deals with cutting it by hand and not in great detail. These compound angles are very difficult to cut by hand unless you're a skilled dovetailer. So I did some experimenting, and I came up with what I think is a much easier way to do it with a bandsaw. And that's what I'm going to show you today. Now for this joint to work, each dovetail must be cut at a compound angle. The angles of the face of each tail must match the angles of the end of each tail. And they must be consistent throughout the joint. So I made this pattern to lay out my tails. The width of the pattern is equal to the width of the strips that I'll be assembling to make my box. That's right, you have to make your box from strips, just as the original buildings were made from logs. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to assemble it. But the width of the strips aren't arbitrary. There's a relationship between the width of the strip, the thickness of the strip, the width, length, and angles of the dovetails. These things have to be calculated correctly so that when you assemble the box, the edges of the various strips meet seamlessly and your box looks like it was created from solid wood panels. If you were building a cabin, you wouldn't fuss over it because you could just pack the gaps with mud and horsehair. But we can't do that with a box now, can we? Don't worry though, I did the math for you. I created some drawings showing how to lay out patterns for four different thicknesses of material. Quarter inch, three eighths, half inch, and three quarters. Of course, this is only a guide. You should cut some test pieces and see how they fit together. You may have to tweak your pattern a little bit, as I did mine especially if your stock isn't exactly a quarter inch, three eighths, half inch, or three quarter inch thick. Mine was just under three eighths, and that threw my pattern off a bit. I had to make my dovetail slightly narrower to account for that. But once I got it dialed in, I was good to go. Before I used my pattern, I cut all my strips to length and width. I tried to keep the strips in the same order that they came off the board so that the grain will match when they're glued back together later. So I marked them with triangles on what will be the inner faces when the box is assembled. I also made a couple of extra strips in case I mess something up when I start cutting. That's always a good idea. Now time to use that pattern. You're going to lay out the angles of the dovetail on what will be the outer faces of each strip. Then use one of the other strips to draw the shoulder lines on both faces. I repeat the process on each end of each strip drawing the dovetail on what will be the outer face, as it will be in the assembled box, and then the shoulder line on both faces. Now, you may be wondering how you're going to cut a compound angle with a two-dimensional pattern. 
Well, we don't have to worry about it because we're going to use a simple jig to take care of it for us. This ramp is built at the same angle that I used for the sides of my dovetails. I made mine 10 degrees. In fact, I made the ramp first. Then I used a bevel gauge to transfer that over when I made the pattern because I wanted the angles to match exactly. You'll see how this works over at the bandsaw. It helps if your bandsaw has a fence to keep the ramp square to the table. I start with my ramp sloping downward from left to right as I'm facing the saw. Now I'm going to cut a kerf on the right side of each dovetail. Just the right side for now. Cut carefully, but leave your pencil line. Don't cut it all away. And be careful not to cut past that shoulder line. Don't forget, you have to make the same cut on each end of each wood strip, just to the right of the dovetails. When you've finished, rotate your ramp 180 degrees so that it slopes down from right to left, and then repeat the process, but this time you're cutting on the left side of each dovetail. Again, be sure to cut on both ends of each strip. And be careful as you exit the cut. The side of the teeth on your bandsaw blade can dig into the dovetail as you pull it out and kind of spoil the corners. After you've cut both ends on all the strips, rotate the ramp so that it slopes down towards you and slide it up beside your blade. Now you'll be cutting the shoulders, but before you make a cut, Look at the end of your workpiece and be sure that the angle of the dovetail is parallel to your saw blade. You don't want the blade to cut into the wide portion of the dovetail as you cut your shoulder. That's why it's important to keep all of your strips oriented in the same direction. That way you can keep track of what will be the inner face and what will be the outer face on the assembled box. If you can't tell by the pencil lines you drew before, you can now look at the shape of the dovetail itself. The wider face of the dovetail is the inner face on the assembled box. You want the wider part, the inner face, to be facing upward as you cut these shoulder lines with the ramp sloping toward you, as you see here. You're only cutting the shoulder on one side of each dovetail, repeating the process on both ends of each strip. Then rotate the ramp 180 degrees so it slopes downward away from you, and cut the shoulders on the other side of each dovetail. For this, you'll have to flip the strips over so the outer faces are now facing upward. I got one of my strips turned around and I messed it up, which is why I said to make a couple extras. Back at the bench, you can lay your strips out using the triangles you drew as a reference. This box will be easier to assemble if you cut some slots for splines in all of the edge joints. So I use a pencil to mark where my slots will have to be cut. Then I cut the slots at the table saw. You want your slots to be as deep as they can be without the table saw's blade cutting into the dovetails on the end as you pass it across. Be sure that you keep the outer face of each strip against the fence, and that way all of your slots will align later, even if it's not perfectly centered. Splines can then be ripped from the same material that your box was made out of. Back at the bench, select the two long strips that will be on the bottom of the box, and the two shorter strips that will be on the top of the box, and rip them exactly in half. You'll see why when you assemble the box. Now take all four strips that will be on the bottom of the box over to the router table and plow about a 1 8 inch wide groove for the box's bottom panel to fit into. On the two long strips, which were the ones I ripped in half, I stopped the groove just short of the dovetailed ends. On the two short strips, I cut the groove all the way down the length. I'm using a solid panel for the bottom, which is a bit larger than the inner dimensions of my finished box will be. I use a hand plane to bevel all four edges so that they'll fit into the slots I cut on my router table. To begin assembling the pieces, I only put glue on the dovetails. I don't glue the bottom panel into its slot. The panel slides deeply into the slot on one end of the box so I can then get that final end strip on, and then I can use my fingers to kind of work the panel back over so that it's floating in all four slots around the perimeter. The rest of the assembly is easy. I build my box upward just like a log cabin. Now you see me gluing it up here, applying the glue to the splines and the dovetails as I work my way up, but this was actually the second time I assembled my box. I dry assembled it first without glue. As I did, I looked for gaps between the strips, and then I used a chisel to fine tune the width of the dovetails, shaving just a tiny bit off their width to close up the gaps between the strips. Log cabins were built in much the same way. 
Each log was put into place, then removed for tuning, sometimes several times during the assembly process. So be patient and take your time. I found it easier to maintain the proper compound angle on the dovetails if I laid my chisel on the bench, tilting it to the right angle, and then pushing my workpiece into the chisel. I could then tell by the thickness of the shaving I was removing if I was changing the angle or not. After you dry fit, you can rebuild your box for the last time with glue, layer by layer, all the way up. If this is your first time, you're likely to have some gaps here and there. But if you use pine like I did, you can apply lots of clamps and close those gaps up. And if any remain when everything is dry, you can add a mixture of sawdust and glue to fill them in. This box was far more difficult to build than a traditional dovetailed box would be. But if you set that on a coffee table the next time you have, say, a dinner party, it'll lead to all sorts of interesting conversations about woodworking and historic log cabin building too. At least it will be if your dinner guests are as interesting as mine. In the meantime, be sure to check out the latest issue of Stumpy Nub's Woodworking Journal, which is always filled with great tips, tricks, and tutorials designed to make you a better woodworker. You can read and subscribe for free at StumpyNubs.com. Happy dovetailing!